Listen to what Paul says. This is seven identities of church that separate the Christian church from the world's religions. He said there is one body, one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is over all, through all, and in all. When you go back and look at it again, you'll see that there are seven ones listed. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mar marvelous grace and the mercy you've shown towards us and America, the church and America. We are in the last days. In fact, we're in the last hour of the last days, according to 1 John, the second chapter. Therefore, we have a powerful work to do in the last hour. The church needs to put their house in order and then turn the world upside down to get it in the right order because the right order is always Jesus Christ. His atoning work on the cross, his burial and resurrection from the dead. <coughs> there is great hope in life that comes from that, Father, and hope with confident expectation of a future life with you forever. We're so thankful for that today. As we approach, Father, the 4th of July and great ministry for us at camp, we thank you, Father, that they both fall on the same idea of freedom. For it was freedom that Christ set us free. And we're thankful for it, not only as an individual, not only as a church, but as an American. We thank you for that principle in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are. <coughs> We are in a, a mini study on that. We are our, our greater. Well, Josh, good to have you home. Can you speak Spanish, son? <laughs> Enough to order, right? You're going to order a hamburger. Yeah, good to have you home. We'll get a report from you once camp is over and all that. Paul, the great missionary, Paul, you know, is the missionary of missionaries. If uh, you want to know what missionary life would really be like, you study the writings of Paul. Be sure to read 2 Corinthians 11. <laughs> uh, decide whether you really want to sign up or not. It is warfare on the front line when you get, as a missionary. You're not just being trained for warfare, you're in it up to your eyeballs on it. Right, Josh? No matter where you are. And so Paul says there are seven doctrines under the new covenant that separate the Christian church from the religions of the world. This is the book of Ephesians for Paul. He said these seven doctrines are essentially important for you to understand what separates the Christian church from the, world, from, from the religions of the world. These seven doctrines. Now, we have looked at one body. We've, we've done a doctrinal study on it. Today, we're going to do one spirit. So rem be mindful that we're in a mini-series on the universality of the Christian church. I want to show you how important this is. If you go overseas and you run into a Christian church, if they, send, if they, if they teach, if these are seven central doctrines that separate them from the religions of the world, you know you've got a good, you're in a setting in a pretty good church. Right? That would be true in America as well. But so each, each Sunday we're taking, now while I'm thinking about this, uh, there will be no church here Tuesday and Wednesday. All of our church services are out at camp. Uh, and all my camp people are gone. Oh, Eddie, what time do you do your night service? By seven, six. You do your night service at six. 
Eddie, do you attend those? When they're... <laughs> <laughs> Is that time to, time to take a break and go get a cup of coffee? That'd be me. Uh, get away from those kids for a half an hour, an hour. Uh, but come on out to Hargis. Uh That would be... Uh, uh, it, it's a YMCA camp at Chelsea. I don't even think they call it Hargis anymore, do they? Yeah. Really? Yeah. You know, this is a wonderful church. I, I promise you could bring up any subject in the whole wide world and somebody can lift their hand and tell you about it. It's the darndest thing I've ever seen. I love you for that. Well, anyhow, Paul talks about these seven doctrines. We, we have studied the doctrine of the one body. That's really important. Not tonight. T today, we're going to talk about the one spirit. There's so much subject here. I'm going, to hit, I'm going to hit just four ideas on it. I'll get as far as I can because I got Ernie up here the second hour. Please don't go home just because it's Ernie. That makes him feel bad. You understand how bad that makes him feel? Ernie be up the second hour. Everybody hits the door and goes, like, well, we can have an early lunch break. Don't do that. This, this guy's really, he's one of our guys. Come on. I don't want you to take a break from mine either. So, it, uh, But anyhow, here, so I want, I want to look at some things that I think are important. One of the things, I, I want you to turn in your Bibles with me for a moment to Hebrews. I want to show you something that's not talked about in the churches at all and not in seminaries, and it should be. Should be a great discussion, but it's not. Of course, we make a big deal out of it here. I got you. Uh, well, let's just have a word of prayer. Uh, he says that uh, Rod is sick. Uh, that's called nursery ministry. I uh, hope not. But, Father, we're... We're thankful for Rhonda, who, who shows up and, and, and honorably serves you through the nursery. We know how important ministry that is. I pray for her and the Al fathers. They minister this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, in Hebrews, of the fifth chapter, 13, 14, I want to show you something. You, you, I don't know why they don't talk about this a lot, because it's all about your spiritual growth. The Word of God... Under the new covenant, now, under the new covenant, the word of God is divided into milk doctrines and meat doctrines. Listen to this, verse 13. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. In other words, what the word of righteousness, how it should be presented in our life, not just to our life. Righteousness, not just how it's presented to our life, but how it's presented from our life. Okay? A baby can't do that. A baby believer can't do that. It can do righteousness to their life, but they can't do it in their life or through their life. They don't have the maturity. It's just a baby. Okay? A baby. In verse 14, but in contrast to milk, Solid feet, food, or the old King James, meat. But solid food, meat, is for the mature, the teleos. Uh, if you want to know what that would be, then you could read Ephesians 4.13. Solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, that is righteousness that is working in your life, for your life, and the righteousness that is available for others who are willing to listen, and how you deal with other people in the righteousness of Christ, how you deal with other people, how you deal with the world, how you deal with other believers, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil which is the bottom line of spiritual growth, the ability to discern good from evil and to choose good over evil all the time. So, in the doctrine today, here is a milk doctrine. Point number one, I've got four on one spirit. 
here is a milk doctrine. The one spirit in our text is a reference to the third member of the Godhead, or what people call the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are one in essence, or deity. I wrote them in the top box. There are ten, ten identities. They are one in essence, and different in person, and function. We're talking about one of the three members of deity, Godhead, God, the Holy Spirit. Right? Do you know where he lives in the world? In the world? Do you know where he lives in the world? Inside every new covenant church age believer. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20. God, the Holy Spirit, under the new covenant, lives inside every person that believes that Jesus died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead. It's called the gospel. When you believe that, you get saved. The moment you get saved, he takes up residence in your body. The third member of the Godhead is found on earth today in the life of every church age believer under the new covenant principle. That's a milk doctrine. The milk doctrine is that God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are one in essence, three in person and function. Different in persons and function. That's a milk doctrine. It's not deep. A baby, this is what you give a baby believer. Why? Because the moment he got saved, he got saved because of a basic principle, God consciousness. Every person, when he wakes up alive, he is conscious of his self-existence and God. The awareness of his self-existence and the existence of God. When he comes to God consciousness, God is obligated and stays positive. God is obligated to give him gospel hearing. What he does with that gospel here and is really important to his time on earth and eternity. God consciousness. Write this down. Under point one, write this down. Romans 1, 19 through 22. That's a very important principle because one of the ways and the primary way that people become aware of God consciousness is creation. Everybody, everywhere, every language, every culture, that's a ding, ding, your bell. Okay? Listen to what he says in verse 19. Because that which is known about God is evidence. Now, I'm in Romans 1.19. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, God consciousness, for God made it evident to them, made it evidence to them, evident to them. And then he explains, when they look at creation, that which has been made to them inside God becomes reality to them who made all this marvelous stuff. And no matter how you try to explain creation, you always have to get back to an ultimate source. That ultimate source in your spirit of life, alive in the world, says it's God. It's not a big bang. 
God. Because who made the Big Bang? And this goes on forever. You've got to get somebody who has no beginning and no end. And for the human being, the logic of that idea is God. Now, nobody could understand what I just said. If you, there's no ph philosophical reasoning that can get you to God who has no beginning and no end. When you stand in his presence of the Lord with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, you will come to understand what that means and won't get it till then because of Deuteronomy 29, 29. Some things are held within mystery. And then will be revealed in full. And so, for people with finite minds like myself, it's enough to believe that the end of this discussion is God who has no beginning and no end. That makes sense to me. Nothing else does. I'd rather accept that concept than any other concept I've heard. I've heard a lot of them. And so I take that, and, and the Bible says in Romans 1, Paul, who traveled the world preaching the gospel of Christ, involved in all kinds of religions out there, he says, this is what I have seen to be a common string of, of human intelligence. And he writes about it in Romans 1. So what I'm saying to you, that's a milk doctrine, and you need to be familiar with what I'm talking about because that's just a milk doctrine. There's nothing difficult about this. That's a milk doctrine. That's not a meat doctrine. Here's the second one. Here's the second one that people miss. This is going to be a milk doctrine. This is not deep. This is not difficult. A baby believer can get it. A baby believer should get it. One of the first things you should teach a new believer is the truth about God. You teach the truth about God because he's come from a world of paganism and their attitude about God. First thing you ought to teach him is God. God is not just this supreme power. He's your Abba Father. He's your Daddy. How good is that? Listen to the second one. Here's a milk doctrine. It's not difficult. It's not heavy. This may be the first time you've ever heard it because you've never put yourself in a church nor a position to learn the Word of God. So here you are. Here's the second milk doctrine. The special function of the Holy Spirit under the New Covenant is the, listen to me now, is the fulfillment of the promise of the Holy Spirit. The promise. God promised the Holy Spirit would come under the new covenant. In other words, when Christ came into the world by virgin birth, kept himself impeccable to the cross, died for all of our sins, was buried and raised from the dead, ascended back and is seated at the right hand of God the Father today. And as a result of that, the Holy Spirit has come to be the major player of the Godhead in the church age under the new covenant. He's the major player. He's not second string. He's the starting quarterback. He's not second string. He's first string. And he comes as a promise from God once Christ appears in the world as the Messiah, fulfills his responsibility, returns to the Father, the advent of the Holy Spirit is as big a deal for the new covenant as Christ's coming. It's a one-two punch. The first coming of Christ, enormously important. For the second coming of Christ, enormously important, is the Holy Spirit. He comes in fulfillment, like Jesus came to fulfill 
the Holy Spirit comes to fulfill the promises of Christ. Jesus comes to fulfill the promises of God. The Holy Spirit comes to fulfill the promises of Christ. He comes to testify of the person and work of Jesus Christ for time and eternity. So, in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, on your paper, an example of the Holy Spirit's work is the sealing and pledge ministry at salvation. It is one of eight salvation ministries of the Holy Spirit, and this is what Paul wrote. In him, Jesus Christ, you also, after listening to the message of truth, what is the message of truth? Listen to me. You're going to miss this. The message of truth is in Christ. I'll read it again because you're missing stuff. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of salvation. Here's what Jesus said about this principle earlier. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father. No man who doesn't come to the Father receives these three truths. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. In him, you have found the way to God. You have found the truth of God. And you have found the life of God in him. In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, number two, having believed. See, not, it's not just hearing the gospel that saves you. It's believing the gospel that saves you, not hearing only. Hearing alone won't save you. It is hearing, understanding to believe. Having also believed, watch, you were sealed. That's a signature of a deal made. The word seal means a signature of a deal entered into, a partnership entered into. A signature, a signature. Of, owner, of ownership, an agreement to buy or to have been bought. Sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Underline that. You'll miss it if you don't, because that's what I'm talking about. Listen, you were sealed in Christ through the gospel, right? H having heard it, understood it, and believed it, you were Sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of what? Promise. Who is a pledge, that's a down payment on a further possession, that is your resurrection. Of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to his praise of his glory. This is a milk doctrine. How do I know? Because it deals with salvation. One deals with God consciousness to gospel. Here it deals with gospel and what it brings to you. This is a milk doctrine. You go like, I don't, I've never heard this. I can't help it. You're hearing it now. I can't help what you haven't. God has drug you in here today or brought you in here or coaxed you in here or however you got here. Don't say automobile. <laughs> Listen. This is so important. This is a milk doctrine. This is not a deep, difficult Christian way of life doctrine. The coming of the Holy Spirit of promise was taught by four people that are really important to the new covenant. This doctrine was taught by John the Baptist in Matthew 3, 11 and 12. It was taught by Jesus in John 7, 37 through 39. And again, in chapters John 14, 15, 16. It was taught 
by the prophet Joel, which was fulfilled partially in 30 AD in Acts 2, 1 through 21 at Pentecost, the Pentecost of 30 AD, the Jewish holiday. By doing that, it brings to fulfillment both with the advent of Christ and the advent of the Holy Spirit, it brings the teaching of Jeremiah on this very subject, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, which calls this action new covenant. That's four big boys. <laughs> I just quoted you four big ones. They carried the promise of the Holy Spirit of the new covenant. This is milk doctrine. This is not meat. This is milk. This is why we teach it around here a great deal. Acts 2.33 Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, Jesus Christ, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured forth that which you both see and hear. You know what that's fulfillment of? Matthew 3, 11. Not 12, 11. That's a basic milk doctrine. This ought to be under your belt, as we say. You need to get this in your soul as a basic doctrine in order because a basic doctrine is a foundation on which you begin to build wisdom about new covenant living and thinking. These are milk doctrines. These are not meat doctrines. I have told you nothing that a baby believer cannot grasp under the ministry of the Holy Spirit and must grasp under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Here's the third one. I'm going to give you a third milk doctrine. One special ministry of the Holy Spirit under the new covenant is eight works of the Holy Spirit at the point of salvation. The moment you believe the gospel of Christ, because this is, is the great ministry link to the Holy Spirit. The moment you believe the Holy Spirit does eight works on your salvation by grace. When it says Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves the gift of God, this is the gift. Out of the 50 things that you receive at salvation, you can never lose in time and eternity, which you, you can pick up from here. We have pamphlets all over the room. On the internet, you can go to the internet and look for the 50 things. Part of the 50 things that you receive at salvation, you can never lose in time and eternity, are eight works of the Holy Spirit that you receive at the point of salvation. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. You may not feel it, but you got it. What baby wakes up and feels like he's alive? They don't feel it. It's only later in life when his intelligence begins to work within his whole system and he says, oh, I feel, I feel like I want something to eat. Meh. Now, these eight works is milk. You ought to know these things. If you go to this church, you should be getting this under your belt. These are foundational doctrines on which you build your spiritual maturity in Christ. Here they are. Adoption. And I gave you the scriptures for them. You're going to have to study this stuff. I gave you baptism of the Holy Spirit. I gave you indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Sanctification by the Holy Spirit. Seals and pledge by the Holy Spirit. Spiritual gifted ministry. Every, every believer in the gospel of Christ under the new covenant church age gets these eight things. You have a spiritually gifted ministry to the church. How is it possible that you don't know it? 
It is a milk doctrine principle. The Holy Spirit wants you to know it. He's been crying, screaming bloody murder over it, and you won't pay attention. This is not a mystery. He's not disguising it. He's not hiding it from you. He's shouting at top of your eardrum. If he's not, I am. <laughs> How do you know if you're a leg or an ear? How do you know if you're an eye or a kidney? Uh, I'll, I'll make it better. Or, or, or a heart. How do you know? You say, well, it's probably not important. It is to the body what member you are. Loose one of them and see. Right? Let's not come to that illustration. Let's just accept this by faith. You need to read the passages I've put down here. Spiritual life. You know when you get it, you get it as salvation. You know what you should do with it? You should try to learn and grow in it so that you can experience the abundant life, not just the life. See, you get life at salvation. What you're after is John 10.10. 10. You're after the abundant life that comes with that life. Now, I want to pick out one. I'm going to take adoption. You know why adoption is very good? You know why that doctrine ought to just flood your soul? Because of Hebrews 12, 8. It's not on your paper enough. I should write it. Hebrews 12, 8. Do you know how every human being is born into this world in regard to God? Illegitimate. Or the King James says, bastards. I like the King James because when people would call me that, it would make me mad. Now when people call me that, it makes me glad because I'm not that anymore. <laughs> I am not that. I once was that, but I'm not that anymore. So when they call me that, I use it as an opportunity to preach them the gospel because I tell them, you know, you were right. Before I met Christ, I was that way, and I'll tell you something. So are you. I don't have to say it. I just teach it. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, we're born illegitimate, and you've got, to be, you've got to be adopted. And listen, at the point of salvation, you don't have to cry, oh, God, I want to be adopted. Don't get saved, and you will be adopted. One of the things you receive in the gift of salvation is adoption from illegitimate. I don't care. Everybody's born illegitimate. Born physically alive and illegitimate because God is not your father. And the day you accept Christ as your savior, i.e. by gospel, God becomes your Abba Father, Romans 8, 14 through 17. And you are adopted and you're a member of the royal family of God. And nobody can take that away from you, not even yourself. How come you didn't know that? How come that is not an important issue? It's a milk doctrine, and you will not grow on the top of that foundational doctrine until you accept it. These are foundational doctrines that you must understand, come to a place of believing, and come to agreement with the Holy Spirit that you are a new covenant believer. And this is a foundation doctrine on which you must build your life. And how important it is to know that God is your Abba Father, that he is your daddy. And God loves you more than any love that you could ever possess in your life. And why that's not enough, I'll never know. No greater love. 
No greater love has ever been demonstrated, Romans 5, 8, than God sent his son to be the propitious death for your, for your sins so that you could become a son of God by grace. You don't have to go through great suffering to become a child of God. The suffering has been done. It's left now to believe, believe, believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is a milk doctrine. It's a milk doctrine. This is not a complicated doctrine. So let's go to a meat doctrine. Here's a meat doctrine. There are nine characteristics of spirituality. That is the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit in a believer's life under the new covenant. Roman, uh, Romans 8, 5 through 9, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, establish the fact that the Holy Spirit indwelling your body is where the great spiritual ministry it's not by works, it's by the ministry of the Holy Spirit that you're a spiritual person. You're a spiritual person because he brought spiritual life to you. He is the spiritual life. It is the spirit that makes you spiritual. It is your flesh that makes you carnal. And I don't care if your flesh is doing spiritual things, it's carnal. It's when the Holy Spirit does spiritual things that you are spiritual. Now we're talking meat. We're talking about the dynamics of the Christian life. And so one of the first things, one of the first things that I'm going to mention to you is the nine fruit of spirituality. Here are the things that you long for. You look in all the wrong closets of your life for these nine things. Now, a house with nine, nine closets is quite, quite a house, ain't it? Wouldn't you say that a house with nine closets is a pretty good-sized house? Well, how many of you have in your house? Listen, when I first come to the South, they didn't have a closet in a bedroom. We have really come a long way. I was in a... Oh, listen, my uncle had a really nice home and no closets. I went, what? So I had to go down and buy a cedar robe. Who knew? Why a cedar robe? Oh, moth. Won't eat my clothes. I said, well, any bugs get in there if it's cedar? Not, not, not hardly. I don't know about hardly. I know I didn't like the smell of the inside, so I don't know if they did or not, but that's how I went. Listen, pretty good-sized house with nine. This is nine fruit. That's like nine closets. Listen, you need to know that these things come to your life by a gift of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to work for love. Many of you do, and I can't find it. No kidding. You're looking in the wrong closet. Love is automatic, is automatically and supernaturally produced to your soul in the way your soul needs it. This because this is the love of God. Not the love of a new dress or a new suit or a new car. This is the love of this is the love of God. And what your soul needs is not the love of something you think would bring you happiness. It's the love that, if you understand it, will automatically bring it. A couple told me the other day, we're no longer in love. I said, what do you mean no longer? See, I, I'm interested in words. 
No longer? Does that mean there was a time when you were? Yeah. So I said, explain it. So they did. And I said, would you like that kind of love from God? Is that the kind of love you think God has for you? They explained how a love can fail and how you grow out of it and grow out. I said to them, would that be kind of love you would want from God? They went, what? Is that the kind of love you would like from God? Oh, not today, honey. Eh, yet. Uh, no, I changed my mind. No, I found somebody else. I mean, what is, what is all this talk about? You see, that's not the love. Nobody would want that kind of love from God, and those people who think it is are legalistic. Love is a gift. It's a gift that keeps on giving. It comes from the Holy Spirit, which is a gift. It comes from the Holy Spirit. It is love that can never find an end, always has a purpose, and is fulfilling to the one who gives it as well to the one who receives it. That's just the word love. Then we got, we've got joy and peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, faith. Right? These are not things you work for in life. These are not things you search outside of yourself for in life. These are things that you have inside your soul in the person of the Holy Spirit that will just go, there it is, baby. This is what you need. You're looking in all the wrong closets. You're not looking in. You're looking out. You look inside to the ministry of the Holy Spirit and listen, before your lips could even say, I want to be loved, they go like, I got it. Before your lips ever say, I need, he's got that need met. You know what you have to do? You have to walk in the power of the Spirit. When you do, he'll give you what you need before you ask. Now think of that deal. Before, now you're on your knees begging, oh God, oh God, oh God. They go like, will you quit? Go to the inner closet. Oh, God, give me patience. Give me patience. You already got it. Quit looking outside. Look inside. Oh, God, give me peace. Give me peace. Give me peace. Quit looking outside. Look inside. You've already got it. Now we're talking business, ain't we? Uh -huh. Tell me we're not talking business. That's why it's a meat doctrine. Now we're down to knit and grit. You know that musical group? <laughs> I mean, that sounds like country western all the way, doesn't it? And listen, you ought to study these nine things. Do you know how, the, you know, listen to me. Do you know how, do you know how Paul closed those two verses out? No, you don't. Nah, you don't know. Should you? Wouldn't you like to know what he said as he wound that little script out? Well, then maybe I ought to turn to it because I'm not going to get to the rest of these anyhow. I know. You're going to have to come back next Sunday. I'll give them to you next Sunday. Okay. okay. And uh, something... Unforeseen should happen. Go to the internet. Or if you're face to face, you'll get it personally. So it won't matter. Look at this. You have verse 23? You have verse 23? Put your eyes on it. Watch this. He goes through this whole list. He uses fruit singular. Comes out of the Holy Spirit, nothing else. Watch this. Against such, there is no law. Against such, there is no legal argument. Against such, there is no legal argument. Against such, there is no legal argument. These are the fruit of the Spirit of God inside you.
inside you, not outside you. These are inside you. And I've only dealt with one of nine characteristics of the importance of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life if you're a believer. Against such, the Holy Spirit produces these as gifts to your life. They come from within side. And when you look to the Holy Spirit to give you peace, it is a gift. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. This is, I've been sent to do my job. Hattoo. Report if you're dirty, sir. Peace. Peace. There you got it. How did you get it? A gift. I'm just here to give out gifts. Every day I give out gifts. All I do is give out gifts. I just give them a gift here and a gift there and a gift here and a gift there. I'm just the gift giver. You don't even pay attention to them. You don't pay any attention to them. Here are nine things that the Holy Spirit has been sent to do. You don't pay any attention to it. You complain because, oh, God, I need patience. You got it. Look inside. Oh, God, I, I need peace. Look inside. I need love. Look inside. Why are you looking outside? You're looking in closets that are not, that have nothing to offer. They may be full, but they're full of foolishness. They will not satisfy you. They will not satisfy you. They will not satisfy you. But when it's given as a gift, it will fulfill the void only the Holy Spirit that understands you personally need. You know what I love about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? It's personal. It's not generic. He treats every one of us uniquely different and in different needs. And he ministers specifically to you in your need, isn't that wonderful? Oh, please tell me that is a wonderful thing. He indwells you personally to deal with you personally in the things that you need to bring your life to fulfillment, to bring it to a place of joy. Oh, by the way, it's an inner gift. <laughs> joy. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way by automobile and internet. We have separated milk from meat of at least importance with the Holy Spirit as our subject and one spirit. We've introduced them, Father, to this great ministry, the indwelling Holy Spirit in our life called spirituality. It's what separates us in the church. It's what separates us from carnality. It's what separates us from the judicial law. Against such, there is no law, no legal argument. We thank you for that. Encourage our hearts to find the fulfillment of our life spiritually in the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. May that be a great subject for us, not just this Sunday, but next Sunday as well. In Jesus' name, amen.